Excellencies, dear colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to who has now joined us. Welcome to this new session of the Geneva Nature Based Solution Dialogues, co convened by the Geneva Environment Network and the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which we refer to as IUCN. IUCN, headquartered in our region, is an essential global actor, bringing together the world's most influential organizations and experts to conserve nature and accelerate the transition to a sustainable world. We have again the pleasure to have with us today leading experts from their network. These nature-based solutions dialogues aim to facilitate further engagement and discussion among the stakeholders in International Geneva and beyond on um, the role um, and opportunities provided by nature-based solutions in the lead up to major environmental negotiations. Today, we are hosting the sixth dialogue and we will be focusing on the ocean. In less than one year now, the governments of Kenya and Portugal will co-host the United Nations Conference on the Ocean in Lisbon. We are very honored to have with us representatives from the host countries. We have also with us leading experts who will be speaking on the key role uh, of nature-based solutions uh, in preserving, restoring and sustainably managing uh, the ocean while delivering benefits for people and nature. We will also be welcoming a guest champion uh, that you will discover uh, just before we start uh, the discussion. Before I give the floor to Mina Epps, Director of the Global Marine and Polar Program at IUCN, who will be moderating today's session, let me uh, remind you that the documents presented, the summary, as well as the video of this dialogue, will be made available uh, on the webpage of uh, this uh, event. We will share the link in the chat. Throughout the event, uh, you can raise your questions by using the chat box. We will use your questions to feed the discussion after the presentations. With that, Mina, over to you. Excellent. So thank you very much, Anna, for an excellent introduction. And very happy to be here as well. So a warm, once again, a warm welcome, uh, especially to our distinguished panelists that we have with us today, but also everyone joining online. I'm very pleased to, to have this, to be moderating today's session, which is focusing on nature-based solutions and how it relates to the ocean. So we know that we live on a blue planet and often when we look at the ocean, we think about the potential solutions, but we also have to go about this in a responsible way, looking at what are the potential trade-offs, um, et cetera. So um, one of the recent the IPBS report really says that only 3% of the ocean is free from human activities. And also from the World uh, Second Ocean Assessment Report, we can see that, you know, um, habitats are heavily degraded. So I think that the, the whole concept of nature-based solution, which I will give a brief introduction to, um, it is very timely to be discussing that uh, in this very uh, important year that we have ahead and really to see where can nature-based uh, solutions fit into um, the year ahead and the important agenda for both biodiversity, climate change, mitigation, adaptation, uh, as well as a post-pandemic sustainable recovery. Um, so with that said, I think, um, you know, especially in the light that governments are leading up to uh, preparing to participate in the upcoming UN Ocean Conference, which will take place in Lisbon, co-hosted by Kenya and, uh, and, and Lisbon together, uh, will be in June 27 to 2nd of July, I believe. So we're very pleased to have uh, Helena Vieira with us today. We'll hear from us shortly. Um, but before handing over the floor, um, I'd like to start with a big, uh, quick introduction or recap on nature-based solutions. Um, so nature-based solutions, we often hear them refer to, but it's really important to think about you know, what is that common uh, definition? And IUCN defines nature-based solutions as actions to protect, sustainably manage and restore natural and modified ecosystem that addresses societal challenges, food and water security and natural disasters effectively and adaptively, simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So that is the IUCN definition, um, which was adopted at um, a World um, uh, Conservation Congress um, in Hawaii, where this definition was 
um, adopted in a resolution, um, and today I believe that actually is the broadest use definition as it was adopted by uh, our 200 states and, and, and government and state agencies, as well as our NGO uh, members. So I think that's the broadly, most broadly adopted definition of nature-based solutions. Um, again, nature-based solutions might not be something new per se, but it's a new approach to implement, for example, a uh, key concept is ecosystem-based um, approaches that we uh, that IUCN has a long history of uh, and experience of ap uh, applying um, on the ground. So if you go to the um, next slide, so the nature-based solution has a potential to address our societal challenges. If you click once again, please, it's great. Um, one important distinction that we like to make is usually to say that we're talking about nature-based nature solutions. So not to be um, confused or exchange, used interchangeably for nature-derived solution or even nature-inspired solutions as it's biomimicry, et cetera. Um, please click again. So, um, Last year, IUCN uh, launched uh, nature-based solutions, the first global uh, standard for nature-based solutions. Uh, and this um, standard is, is um, you know, a kind of guidance to best practice of how to kind of implement nature-based solutions based on the, not only on the, the, the agreed definition, but actually has, has a kind of benchmark and assessment tool. So what it really does is looking at how can you address you know, um, the environmental and societal challenges through a nature based solutions. And it basically is a facilitative tool that focusing it has key um, eight criteria, which you can see uh, with the icons and under each icon, you can see um, the different eight criteria that um, is in the uh, nature based solution standard. So at the heart of this is really to look at the societal challenges but as well as the economic viability and, and how you design them and, and, and also to bring them into scale. Um, and then we look at the kind of inclusive governance. And then a little bit where you can say more as a response to this would be, you know, the adaptive management that needs to be put in place and how you mainstream these eight criteria. So it's a really holistic approach to address environmental societal challenges. So it's not nature-based solutions for climate change or nature-based solution for biodiversity. It's really kind of looking at this holistically and um, and then applying the standards to whatever your project or program. Um, it could be um, a naturally determined contribution plan for a country that you can also use the nature-based solutions uh, standard uh, for your and blue NDCs, I should say. Um, next slide, please. So also, um, I, I mentioned that the nature-based solutions both definition um, was um, adopted in Hawaii at the IUCN World Conservation Congress. So we recently had another um, IUCN Conservation Congress, which was held in Marseille earlier this month. It brought together some 5,700 participants, as well as um, there were on-site visitors, 25,000, as well as a few thousand um, registered online participants. Um, and it was also briefed live into a big audience. And this was really the first um, big uh, bio event or summit focusing on biodiversity. So it received a, a lot of attention as such. And within that, um, nature-based solutions were referenced uh, throughout and the importance was recognized, whether it was land or sea intervention. Um, and in the Marseille Manifesto, the nature-based solution was really integrated throughout uh, on the, under the three main themes. So whether it was mitigating and uh, adapting to climate change or biodiversity, but also on the um, actually building back um, the post-pandemic recovery. So it was very prominent and a lot of commitments as well were made in relation to nature-based solutions. So I would say without any kind of further delay, um, I think it's it's time that we hear from our speakers that we have with us today. Um, I'm very delighted to um, to, to start off um, to, by introducing, we have first out um, uh, Helena Vieira, who's the Director General of the Maritime Policy Ministry of Sea from Portugal. 
She would be followed by another intervention from His Excellency, Ambassador Cleopa Malou, I hope I pronounced that correctly, who is with us today and is the permanent representative of Kenya to the UN and other international organizations based in Geneva. And then we'll hear from Arthur Tuda, and Arthur Tuda is the Executive Secretary for the Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association, WIOMSA. Um, and then we will also hear from uh, Rafaela Legovello, who is an expert uh, on aquaculture, on ecosystem uh, based approaches to aquaculture, and also President of Ocean Respect. Um, and then we will hear from uh, Java Batista, who's the deputy head for the fund secretariat fund for the global fund for coral reefs. And so we'll hear a little bit about private sector investment uh, in relation to nature based solution. Java will be followed by uh, Abhishek Goyal, who is the senior technical director for the standards for the gold standard. Um, and really, he will be shedding some light and what is the role of accreditation and certification within nature-based solutions. And then we will have Nicolas Pascal, who will also join us, um, uh, who is the Executive Director of Blue Finance. So we'll also get to hear a little bit about more kind of on the ground and practical examples of what nature-based solutions can look like. And then we'll have our, our guest MBA, MBS champion, um, and then we will be able to follow up with having a, a discussion, which we hope that you will all join us for a Q&A um, to, to uh, you get an opportunity to ask questions uh, to our panelists. So if that sounds uh, very good to everyone, I would start by giving the floor to distinguished Helena Vieira. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mina. Thank you uh, for this uh, honorable invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with this amazing uh, group of panelists. Um, and I would like to congratulate the organization for bringing up such a, an important topic for this, uh, for this event, for this sixth uh, um, debate. So, I would like to just frame my intervention. Uh, I, I don't have any slides. I was asked not to bring slides, but so I would like to, to frame my intervention intervention going from local, from Portugal uh, to global to the um, UN uh, conference. So uh, I'm not sure, but uh, some of you might be aware that Portugal is actually one of the leading countries in uh, developing national ocean related strategies there that are used to frame uh, the national politics. So actually we have just approved in uh, May this year, our third uh, national ocean strategy. And this one um, actually learns from the previous uh, antecessors, but it goes um, one step further. And it goes one step further in framing the whole uh, document around one key principle, which is without uh, having a healthy ocean, none of the development axes can actually occur, the economical, the environmental, and even the societal uh, axis. So this is actually the vision for the whole uh, document. This strategy actually uh, is designed around 10 uh, decade strategic goals, which are uh, developed around the main uh, challenges we have for the next 10 years. And then Portugal has identified 13 priority areas of intervention that will help achieve the 34 um, goals for 2030 around these strategic uh, objectives. So to fully implement this national strategy, so the national strategy is the framework and it's the, the political uh, and civic, civil framework for the next 10 years surrounding uh, the, the blue economy and all sea related activities. But then we have also designed uh, an action plan, which is kind of the roadmap to how to implement uh, what's designed in that strategy. And this roadmap was just approved this month, so in September, um, and it contains 185 uh, actions uh, that will actually uh, uh, contribute to each specific uh, strategic objective and to which uh, using each of the priority areas that we have identified. So in the end, this uh, action plan is a complex, well, not so complex, it's a matrix where you can actually look for your 
your favorite uh, priority intervention area towards your smart uh, strategic goals and see which measures uh, are going to be taken uh, in the next 10 years to achieve those those goals. So I would like to to call attention to the first strategic goal of this strategy, which is called to fight climate change and pollution and restore uh, ocean ecosystems. This is an, um, a particular um, strategic goal where MBS uh, solutions will have an important contribution to climate change adaptation and to disaster risk uh, reduction. Amongst the targets that I've mentioned, the 2030 targets within this strategy, we have one specific target uh, included, which is the protection of 30% of our coastal and marine areas under national jurisdiction. jurisdiction through the classification of marine protected areas, the approval and implementation of management and conservation plans for these areas. So this is a very particular and smart target that we wish to uh, accomplish by 3030 in our national uh, waters. The most important measure, so when we think of now how we are we going to, to implement this, uh, it's in the action plan, and it will be to implement a national program uh, to map coastal and marine habitats to a very high level uh, detail, all its ecosystems and services, assess their conservation status and then identify priority restoration measures. So this is the first step to, to achieve such um, uh, an ambitious goal. These nature-based solutions are, uh, as, as Mina mentioned, key applications of the ecosystem-based approaches in many areas of inter intervention. And we cannot forget that actually preserving, restoring, and sus sustainably managing um, nature is actually an economic imperative, given that all the economic activities will clearly depend on this healthy ocean. And by coupling these two, uh, even within this national strategy, we can increase the outputs of the ocean. So, solutions for sustainably managed oceans involves great knowledge and deep knowledge green technology development and innovative uses of marine resources targeting their sustainability and life cycle management. It also includes uh, addressing the threats to health, ecology, economy and governance of the oceans. Only with this holistic view, which is the, the vision of the Ocean National Strategy 2030 in Portugal, can we actually, uh, we believe this is the only way we can succeed. So. We have several examples of national of um, uh, nature-based solution projects in Portugal. I will leave the examples for the debate in the second part. Um, uh, and I would like to, to go on from the national also to the outside. So we are not only implementing nat nature-based solutions uh, uh, nationwide, but we are also advocating it outside. At the United Nations, Portugal has encouraged the promotion of conservation and sustainable use of the oceans. As, the, as one of the outsets of the 2030 agenda negotiations. Portugal is currently committed on the negotiations of the future agreement uh, beyond um, in waters beyond the national jurisdiction um, and also in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Effectively, promoting and advocating for the conservation and sustainable use of the ocean has been a priority to us since the first stage at the UN negotiations of the 2030 agenda. As uh, we've heard already today a few times, we are co-organizing with Kenya the next UN conference uh, to be held in Lisbon next year. The new dates have just been confirmed, 27th of June to the 1st of July, and have been, uh, of course, recently approved by U UN General Assembly, and Portugal is putting a lot of, a lot of energy into the organization of this global event. The COVID-19 pandemic has postponed the Ocean Conference twice, uh, but it has not postponed the challenges we face in the ocean. Ocean sustainability requires a new impetus of common uh, action. So this is what we actually hope to bring uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the UN Conference, and we sincerely believe that a constructive debate will bring a common vision and common solutions after uh, this, this gathering. Stakeholders dialogue and new commitments from governments and civil society is what we are looking for and will further improve sustainability solutions. I would also like to emphasize that the Ocean Conference is related to other initiatives at the global level. Uh, notably, the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and its vision aimed at achieving the science we need for the ocean we want. 
We need to use the knowledge for transformational action needed to achieve a healthy, safe and resilient ocean. Also important, and another interconnection and a global view of all of this, is the interconnection with the UN decade uh, of ecosystem restoration. Indeed, there has never been a more urgent need to revive damaged ecosystems than now. We actually need a healthy uh, ocean environment in, over, in order to cope with all the accumulated uh, damage, but also to to re, uh, re, re, re boost the, the capacity of the ocean to, to respond to the new challenges. So ensuring the best possible knowledge that we have about these ecosystems is the only way to boost common action on, on, on the marine ecosystem restoration. So the ocean, as we all know, it is fundamental to life on planet, but somehow we still keep forgetting it. It's important as a source of biodiversity, but it also plays a vital role in the climate system, in the water cycle, in the food we eat, in the oxygen uh, we breathe, in the nutrition that we can have as a population, in the jobs and livelihoods of many. It also provides means for maritime transportation, and we've seen how important this was in this tremendous pandemic that we've been through, uh, but it also is plays an important part of our natural and cultural heritage. And it's only a sustainable ocean based economy that will contribute to us uh, being able to continue to live on this planet and eradicate poverty. We are aware of the importance of the ocean, but we are profound, profoundly alarmed by the momentum of emergency that the ocean is facing on a daily basis. Sea levels are rising and Portugal is actually one of the countries very exposed to this. The ocean is warmer and more acidic. Plastic pollution is uh, continuing to enter the ocean and our dishes, uh, our plates every day. Uh, a third of the fish stock stocks are overexploited. We need new technologies and we're going to hear about them to actually feed the population and, and sustainably manage the ocean. Um, and uh, we also need to restore the ocean to change uh, the climate uh, route that we are taking on. So therefore, Portugal is highly committed to ocean conservation. We are motivated to let this dialogue uh, flow in 2022 in the first UN conference uh, that we have um, going to organize. So we hope to have you all on board in Lisbon uh, one year from now. Uh, and to have government representatives, civil society, stakeholders, companies to debate the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goal 14 and how we can work together to sustainably manage the ocean resources. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helena, for a very comprehensive, enthusiastic and very ambitious national plan that you've just uh, shared with us. Um, and I think, you know, as many countries have signed up for the 30 by 30 um, and also seeing how marine protected areas can be nature-based solutions, but, but also to see how can we make it work for nature and people, which I think is absolutely paramount. And, and thank you as well for, even if you're discussing the national plans to even talk about the areas beyond national jurisdiction and the importance of the protection of the high seas as well. Um, I did initially have a follow-up questions on the UNFCCC and the national accounting, which I think I will say for the um, uh, exciting discussions that we're gonna have a little bit later. Uh, and of course, you mentioned the UN Decade of Ocean Science, which is paramount is really to kind of leverage this, uh, but also seeing the UN Decade of Ocean Science as basically the le leveraging between um, these different kind of international conferences or negotiation that is ongoing, uh, notably, you know, the UNFCCC, the COP26, Kunming, COP15, uh, and the BB&J negotiations, which will resume again, hopefully next year. So I think you mentioned you talking about it as a connection and, and the ocean is really what's connected us all. So I think that was uh, uh, paramount. Um, and the science uh, that all the emerging science that is also coming out under the UN decade um, and really looking at the multi-stressors uh, effect from, from climate change. So thanks again. Um, we're running a little bit over time. So um, I will move on to your co-host, uh, Kenya, uh, which we're delighted to have here. I don't know if you can uh, perhaps uh, switch on your camera. His Excellency Ambassador Cleopa Malu, are you here with us? Yes, I am. Thank you. Lovely to have you with us today. So I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mina and um, Diana, my colleague, the previous speaker. Um, 
uh, congratulations for organizing this forum. I'm delighted to share our perspectives in this dialogue to enable us collectively establish a common understanding in reconciling oceans and human activities. Just a recap that nature-based solutions are critical for green recovery and shared prosperity. Today, oceans are threatened and sustainable human actions continue to negatively impact on our oceans and further threaten our food security, water supplies and our biodiversity. The delivery of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is heavily reliant on oceans, seas and marine resources. In particular, SDG 14, Life Below Water, seeks to protect our oceans. This year, 2021, marks the beginning of the UN proclaimed the Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, that is 2021 to 2030. The Ocean Decade is taking place in a dynamic world, advances in technology and scientific discoveries, as well as global events like the COVID-19 pandemic, will continue to reveal new challenges and the opportunities for the Ocean Decade. The decade offers us a unique opportunity to transform and co-design scientific knowledge leading to practical and sustainable solution. Kenya continues to highlight the importance of sustainable blue economy in achieving the ocean we want by 2030. Support efforts to reverse the cycle of decline in ocean health and creation of improved conditions for sustainable development of the ocean seas and costs are urgently needed. In Africa, synergies are being drawn from frameworks that have highlighted the aspiration of the African people, such as the Agenda 2063 of the African Union, as well as the Africa's 2050 Integrated Maritime Strategy. The African Union has also retained the 2015 to 2025 as the decade of African seas and oceans and the date of 25th July as the African Day of Seas and Oceans. Evidently, efforts meant to draw attention to the well-being of the seas. Towards this end, Kenya continues to be at the forefront towards realization of the UN Decade for Ocean Science through a number of initiatives that are taking place in our country. Among them is that, as you know, Kenya co-hosted in Japan with Japan and Canada the first global sustainable blue economy. And as you have heard, in, uh, we will be hosting, co-hosting with the Portugal, the next UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon in 2022. Kenya, as you know, was among the first world countries to endorse the UN Decade for Ocean Science Plan and Report. And also we have developed several initiatives through the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute, including gears that allow at of fishermen to venture into the deep seas. To promote sustainable blue economy, Kenya is conducting innovative research to extract bioactive compounds from sea flora and animals that may prevent the growth of matter on the submerged portions of the ship structures. Indeed, Kenya has finalized plans to start developing its marine spatial plan in line with the recommendation of the 2020 high-level panel Port on Sustainable Ocean Economy. Kenya is as a reward known project, which we call Mikoko Pamoja Project at Gazi in the Kwale County, which is the first mangrove blue carbons project in the world and it protects mangroves and ensures the continued capture or assimilation of carbon from the atmosphere. Communities in this area of Gazi and Fanga are now financially benefiting from selling carbon credits. Lastly, Go Blue Initiative Program was launched in Kenya on March 25th, 2021 to support Kenya's costs and blue economy. The four-year program aims to protect Kenya's coastal ecosystems while creating environmentally friendly jobs in a host of industries, including recycling, tourism, and small-scale fishing. Regarding coral reefs, which are endangered across the globe, so far, up to half of the world's coral reefs have been lost. And we are informed that if global temperatures do rise by 1.5 degrees centigrade, 90% of all the coral reefs could disappear. 
Reef degradation jeopardizes one of the richest resources or sources of biodiversity on Earth and the livelihoods of a billion people. At the Kenya coast, massive decline of healthy coral reef of course poses danger to the marine ecosystem and the maritime sector. There is danger in reduced tourism, loss of coastal protection that may lead to poverty, property damage and erosion, leave alone loss of livelihoods. The government has enacted measures to promote better fishing practices that are less harmful to the reef. Kenya's marine parks are committed to protecting coral reef communities with higher hard coral cover and larger diversity of finfish, and many stakeholders have been involved. Kenya has become second only to the seashells in the Indian Ocean region to take up coral gardening to stimulate natural regeneration and recovery and to restore habitat complexity. These projects are currently being expanded in other degraded coral reef sites across the region. The Global Fund for Coral Reefs, officially announced in September 2020 on the sidelines of the 75th session of the UN General Assembly, came in handy to supplement Kenya's effort in conserving the coral reefs. The fund plays an important role in conserving and restoring the critical ecosystems which are under threat around the world. This is the first impact fund dedicated to SDG 14. Kenya Tanzania Transboundary Conservation Area was among the initial recipients of the project fund. Fund is being invested in profitable businesses and the ecosystem projects to guarantee the resilience and conservation of marine biodiversity, adequate living conditions of local coastal communities, and a return to private investors. Ultimately, the fund will prevent the extinction of coral reefs by eliminating the coral reef financing gap which has existed and supporting interventions for their best chance of survival or seeks to promote a protect, transform, restore, recover approach in priority locations with the resilient reefs of exceptional biodiversity. As we have heard from the previous speaker, the world is called to, to an urgent uh, attention to make sure that the balance between the oceans and human uh, activities is implemented sooner than later. In implementing all these measures, we are seeking to contribute to the transformational change that will put nature on the path to recovery by 2030 and achieve the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. Kenya intends to, be, to take lead and to continue with its activities to ensure the coastal line within our boundaries is preserved and regenerated to support the livelihoods of our people. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for an uh, excellent intervention, as well as highlighting the importance of food security uh, and the role that the blue foods can play within this um, sphere, and uh, very timely as well with the UN summit, uh, UN Food Systems Summit, uh, and the importance of integrating the blue food, which actually is something that we will be talking about later on and related to kind of fisheries and aquaculture, uh, but we have to hold on um, a little bit further. And, and again, we all look forward to the launch on the 5th of October for the second um, assessment of the, the world status of, of the coral reefs, which will be launched on the 5th of October. Uh, so indeed, and we will hear from the Global Fund for Coral Reefs uh, a little bit later here as well. Um, and I look forward to following the decade of African seas and ocean. Um, that's great. And with your vision for 2050 vision, indeed. Um, so let's see. Um, thank you very much. And now let's see if we manage to get uh, Arthur Tuda uh, on online. Uh, Arthur Tuda is joining us uh, from uh, the Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association. Very nice to have you with us. It's a pleasure. And I look forward to hearing your perspective, even if we're perspective, even if we're staying in the region. Um, be great to hear you kind of additional and also looking at it from kind of a gender equality lens. So, uh, Arthur, welcome. And uh, the floor is yours. So, if you could switch on your camera and sound. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, checking if you're able 
able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you and see you. Just speak close Excellent. to the mic and loudly. Perfect. All right, thank you. I had trouble connecting, but it's good I've connected now. And thank you very much uh, for this invitation. Uh, my name is Arthur Tudor, as uh, already been said, and I am from uh, Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association, uh, YOMSA, which is uh, an association uh, that supports marine science uh, in the Western Indian Ocean region. We've been in existence for the last uh, 30 years, uh, starting from a very small organization of a uh, few scientists. Uh, in our association of about 600 scientists in the Western Indian Ocean region. Uh, so we bring together uh, marine scientists from different disciplines uh, to be able to support uh, different aspects of ocean and, and coastal governance and, and management in the Western Indian Ocean region. So I'll just give a short uh, brief of what WAMSA is uh, doing or has done uh, in relation to today's uh, discussion. And uh, as I said, uh, for the last 30 years, we've supported uh, different aspects of research that support management, uh, restoration, as well as protection of marine and coastal ecosystems in the Western Indian Ocean region. Up to date, uh, we've funded more than uh, 80 uh, fully funded research programs covering different aspects from fisheries uh, to mangrove restoration and protected areas and, and many aspects, governance of oceans, and, and many more. And uh, this support has gone to different institutions that we work with, including universities, research institutions, as well as uh, uh, NGOs that support uh, marine and coastal management in the region. So over the years, WAYOMSA has uh, endeavored to identify some of the gaps that need to be addressed to be able to support uh, uh, sustainable management of our oceans. And uh, through that, we've uh, been able also to uh, support uh, a wide range of studies in the region. Uh, we boast of some of the best research uh, in marine science that have been conducted uh, in this region. And we continue to support our individual scientists, particularly paying more attention now to young scientists and, and women who are now emerging uh, in science. So I also support two important networks the Women in Science uh, Network, which brings together experts from the region, uh, mainly women who work in different fields in marine science. This network has been around for the last six years, and we are seeing that it's helping us to bridge the gaps that existed previously, where work on marine sciences was dominated by, by, the, by, by the male counterparts. We are also supporting the Early Career Scientist Network in the region, uh, which is an upcoming network of young scientists made up of about 200 young scientists who are actively involved in different aspects of marine science. So WAMSA directly funds different projects uh, that support uh, this work. But other than supporting individual scientists, we work with individual countries to support uh, uh, initiatives that are aimed at uh, improving uh, uh, the marine and coastal management. We've developed guidelines for restoration of seagrass beds and uh, mangroves that are used across uh, the region in 10 countries of the region. We've also supported work on marine protected areas. Uh, recently, we developed uh, uh, the most updated uh, catalog of marine protected areas in the region and also are now developing uh, capacity building programs for 143 marine protected areas uh, in the region. So WAMSA is, is focused on supporting the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. Uh, we've come up with a range of programs and activities that we are continuing to develop to see how we can uh, support the decade of ocean science, because our main focus is supporting science uh, for sustainable ocean governance. And in our recent uh, strategic plan for the next five years, our main focus is going to be on restoration, a science that supports, supports restoration of our ecosystems, uh, science that supports marine spatial planning in the region, and science that supports uh, ecosystem management, ecosystem-based management, and particularly paying keen attention to marine protected areas 
and locally managed marine areas in the region. So Wyomsa also is involved in uh, supporting the SDGs, particularly SDG 14 on marine litter, on pollution, and on ocean acidification. So we have programs that are currently running that are looking at uh, issues of ocean acidification. We've set up monitoring programs across six countries in the region uh, to establish uh, baseline data for ocean acidification parameters, as well as uh, marine litter monitoring programs that we've also established in, in six countries. So these are activities that are currently running in the region supported by Wyomsa, and all these aim to support the decade and uh, the SDG goals, and particularly those focused on SDG 14, as well as those focused on climate change. So in a nutshell, that is what we do uh, in the region to support countries, as well as science done by institutions and individuals in the Western Indian Ocean region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Arthur. Uh, for all the excellent work that you're doing in, in Wyomsa and the region. I think it's a really, truly regional approach to the many different uh, scientific uh, challenges and environmental challenges that you have. Um, and also really delighted that one of the outcomes from the um, IUCN Conservation Congress is really looking at the Great Blue Wall Initiative, which is really also focused on, on, on regenerative, uh, inclusive governance and productive sea scapes. Um, so I think this is, um, it's still off. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Does that take the pause here? So thank you very much. And I would like to come back to you a little bit later in the, in the questions and hear about how you apply the nature based solutions within that. Um, I would like to turn to Rafaela Leguvelo, um, who is also joining us here today and really talking about nature based solutions or, or even if, um. It's also been discussed that fisheries and aquaculture can be nature based solutions. So we'd like to hear a little bit uh, from you, Rafael, and the work that you have been doing or we've been doing in, in collaboration with you as well. And, and um, also in, in under the light of the blue economy. So, Rafael, I'll happily give you the floor and. Um, okay, thank, thank you. Mina. Myself. Thank you and uh, thank you for um, for this invitation to talk. Uh, uh, and this webinar with all these uh, great panelists. So, I mean, uh, I'm going to be talking on uh, from a really practical point of view about uh, NBS because, you know, one of the idea of the NBS uh, frame and the concept is to actually uh, reconcile the blue economy and, um, and different sectors of activity and find out uh, the best solutions and uh, when we're talking, for instance, on the fisheries and, and uh, aquaculture for seafood, uh, NBS could be transferred to um, agro agri systems. So why not considering NBS for the uh, seafood production and uh, critical um, issues such as the fisheries uh, are meeting, like uh, you know that one third of uh, the marine fish stocks are still being considered as overfished, not talking about the pollution problems, extra, et cetera. So, I mean, fisheries, seafood coming from fisheries is a real problem. And then um, aquaculture, everybody knows, you know, particularly in the, for instance, in the countries of the Southeast Asia, but also Indian Ocean countries, we know the huge potential that has been behind the aquaculture production over the past decades but it's you know it's it's almost 50 percent of the seafood today but uh, we know also all these um, environmental and social negative impacts which have been uh, associated to um, to the production of um, aquatic animals etc etc so it, it actually really makes sense uh, to consider the NBS concept and frame uh, global standard framework for the, the case of aquaculture and for probably also for fisheries. And um, with the IUCN marine program and the ecosystem based aquaculture group, we've been exploring for years now how the, the negative impacts from aquaculture could be minimized by promoting an ecosystem approach for aquaculture, best practices, etc., and exploring for the 
past few years, we've been exploring synergies between mine aquaculture activities, mine protection, and coastal communities, coastal resilience. Um, in Marseille, very recently, we presented uh, with the IUCN uh, Marine Program, we presented uh, this work was funded with the, the French Development Agency, and we presented case studies of various parts of the world, including Zanzibar, Tunisia, Indonesia, and French Polynesia, where aquaculture and marine protected areas could be part of a global economy strategy associated with other sectors such as uh, fisheries and tourism. And solutions of uh, example of a blue economy really have to be, we know that, have to be built first of all locally, especially, and then upscaled. So it really makes sense to actually uh, uh, use the global standard for these, uh, let's say, fisheries or aquaculture related nature based solutions. So we explored, and this is what we did over the past year, we explored the, the concept of NBS applied as applied to aquaculture. You know that uh, aquaculture is very diversified from you know, low trophic species raised and plant, aquatic uh, plants, but also algae, and then uh, cage systems with you know, the, the carnivorous fish. But so we have all sorts of situations, all sorts of systems. And the question is, how actually can uh, an aquaculture-based system uh, on uh, in coastal areas or in marine uh, areas, a little bit offshore, could be part of an NBS or even constitute one valid NBS? And um, this is a very practical work we made and which is going to be published. But we run into uh, details with all the different criteria. And uh, we questioned how these criteria could be actually addressed positively with aquaculture systems. And, and perhaps it will bring new opportunities, in fact, to develop some aquaculture projects in some places in the world. Like, I mean, um, the criteria one, which is uh, considering all the societal challenges that uh, potentially NBS should uh, address. Um, well, I think we usually think of aquaculture system and fishery system in terms of food security and local economy. So, but, but the fact of having this uh, uh, criteria one of NBS may, may, makes, me, makes me you think of potential new targets and some aquaculture systems could be associated to climate mitigation, to uh, the restoration of marine habitats, and um, also for some societal um, issues such as uh, gender, you know, women empowerment, et cetera, et cetera. So then other criteria will actually provide interesting uh, way of uh, looking at the sustainability of aquaculture systems. Like, for instance, um, the criteria, uh, criterion three of NBS, which is, which is clearly stating uh, how do you actually get a biodiversity net gain in aquaculture system? So, most of the time, we are looking at uh, the, these uh, systems of aquaculture from a negative point of view. Here, we will uh, uh, provide an, uh, an, a new dimension, perhaps looking for some synergies between marine conservation and aquaculture systems, and how some aquaculture system can uh, be benefiting to the global um, biodiversity in the, the, in the area which is uh, considered. So again, you know, some uh, tools and special monitoring uh, uh, parameters may be investigated to, to prove that. But this is a, also an interesting topic in, behind the NBS approach to apply to aquaculture. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. And we look forward to hearing more about your experience in applying the NBS standard to aquaculture uh, projects. Um, I think, man, thank you again for highlighting, um, you know, that a lot of the negative associated with aquaculture and not only about how can we mitigate those but moving from that to kind of net positive gains so thank you very much um and and from that is i think it's a nice segue as well to look at yes 
you know, once you be able to have this kind of positive project, are they economically viable? So I'd like to invite Jaban, um, Jab Jabba uh, Batista from the Global Fund of uh, Coral Reefs uh, or the Demonstration Fund to really see how, how does this uh, work and practice and how do you bring those um, investment and finance sector together? So over, over to you, Jabba, the floor is yours for your intervention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mina, for the invitation and, and being part of this dialogue, which I think it's it's already quite an excellent. Um, I, I would like to talk to you about, about uh, what I call financing solutions. I think many many of us call them like that. Director General Vieira was talking about the importance of political commitment um, in the road to to Lisbon next year. And um, our colleague Arthur Tuda was also talking about the value of science and the importance of science for establishing nature-based solutions. But there is a very third important and powerful element for making sure that nature-based solutions thrive, and that is financing solutions. And um, I will talk to that within the context of coral reefs around the world and the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, and maybe highlighting a little bit of what Ambassador Mailu already mentioned, um, coral reefs today um, have a value of about $10 trillion annually. They support a quarter of all marine life on Earth. They are what underpin um, key sectors like the tourism sector in, in several countries around the world. They provide livelihoods for local communities and they provide employment. So in some um, some estimates indicate that coral reefs actually support the livelihoods of about 1 billion people around the planet. But indeed, um, the coral reefs are in peril um, with 90% of them um, quite, quite degraded and facing extinction in the next 30 years. And that's where, where the coral fund for coral reefs comes in um, because all this degradation is happening, yes, because of climate change, because of all the, the drivers of degradation, but we also don't have a key element for, for being successful, and that is financing, as I mentioned before. Current levels of financing for coral reefs are seven times lower than what we actually need to ensure their future. And launched in 2020, the GFCR is um, the first um, UN impact fund dedicated to SDG 14, life below water. And it's designed as a blended finance vehicle that is going to mobilize about $625 million um, with, within the next 10 years for coral, coral positive actions in, in countries around the world. And we will be doing this by investing in the most resilient reefs around the globe to give them a chance for survival so that then they can help us restore the reefs around the world when, when we continue to suffer the impacts of climate change. And the second main objective of the fund is to, as, as we protect those most resilient reefs, is to then also reduce the drivers of degradation to, to further um, increase their, their resilience. Um, one of the things that I find quite interesting about the GFCR is that in, in the model that we have established, we, we are promoting, as Mina just said, uh, a demonstration fund that is is aiming at showing the world that we need to go beyond grant financing. And that's why this is a blended finance approach. Um, we can have all the grants in, in the world and they are very much needed. But if we don't start par partnering with the private sector, with impact investors, we are not really gonna generate the amount of resources that we need to save our corals. And, and that's why um, the GFCR focuses on, on this link between grant financing and private sector financing, where, where the grant activities that we finance that include um, feasibility studies, technical assistance, capacity building, monitoring evaluation, really become the basis to enable then the creation of positive reef businesses that can then um, be ready to absorb um, investments from, from private sector actors. And, and that's that's really important because if we really want to to accomplish change, we, we need to think in in new ways on how we finance um, coral reefs. And um, just to conclude, Mina and and all 
um, at the beginning, I mentioned that that we were talking already about three key ingredients that are needed for nature-based solutions to, to thrive, um, the policy commitment, the science, and also financing. But there is a fourth element that I think it's crucial for, for creating change, and that, and that is partnerships. But it's actually even beyond partnerships. I, I think we need to start talking about coalitions for change, and that's what also the GFCR aims to be a coalition for change. We, we are um, growing a powerful coalition of members that is currently growing. Um, we currently have support from the governments of the UK, France, Germany, um, two foundations, the Paul G. Allen Foundation, the Prince Albert the Second of Monaco Foundation, and we work in partnership as well with three UN agencies, UNDP, UNEP, and the UNCDF. Um, that, that is really part, I think, of what um, is hopefully going to make on successful is, is that focus on partnerships and, and coalitions. But this focus of co on coalitions is not only at the high level um, of working with donors and UN agencies. We, we are also aiming and striving for making sure that we can translate this, this idea of coalitions to the programs that we are developing and implementing on the ground. And in fact, I'm actually quite glad to see uh, my colleague Nicola Pascal from Blue Finance in this event with us because Nicola and Blue Finance are what we call convening agents, which are the, the agents with whom we partner um, to develop the programs in the countries that we work. And they are really that glue that bring together different actors, um, including government, civil society, local private sector, to ensure that the programs that are developed to result in positive business solutions are also successful. So um, I think with that, Mina, I would like to, to conclude my, my remarks and thank you again for the invitation. And I look forward to being with all of you as well in Lisbon next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Java. Uh, for telling us about blended finance for coral reefs uh, and how you actually bring the actors together. A uh, great example. But before we uh, get to hear from Nicolas, I'd like to um, invite Abhishek Goyal from the Gold uh, Standard and really to talk about the role and need for robust standards to really to catalyze action in the ocean investment uh, in especially related to nature based solutions or, or other uh, standards or um, initiatives. So, Abhishek, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you very much for being with us today. I hope it's thanks. not too late for you. Thanks. Thanks, Mina. Uh, um, I'm very thankful to, to IUCN and UNIT for giving me this opportunity to speak um, on this event you know, along with this esteemed group of uh, panelists you know, that we have today. Um, so, as you said, you know, I, I have been asked to speak on the you know, importance of uh, standards and third party certifications in, in, you know, catalyzing or mobilizing uh, finance uh, for, for actions in, you know, in oceans. So, so before I start that, uh, you know, let me just give you like two lines on, on the organization, you know, uh, Gold Center, you know, what we do. So, so we are an organization uh, based out of Geneva. Uh, and for the last 15 years, you know, we have been in the business of uh, setting standards and certification systems uh, for certifying projects in, in, in different sectors um, and mobilizing, you know, climate finance uh, for, for these projects. Uh, so, 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 you know, from that experience, we, uh, we see that, you know, the certification and standards, you know, would have a very important role to play. Uh, and also, you know, mobilizing uh, finance for for oceans. So before I, you know, go further on that, uh, let me just, you know, uh, highlight kind of uh, two types of standards that we that we all, you know, would would know about. So one are, you know, one is a group which is a process focused standards. Uh, you know, where, whereby these standards ensure that the actions or projects or systems or products, you know. They are designed and managed uh, properly, uh, which are, you know, primarily ISO based uh, standards. The second category of standards is, you know, is process plus outcome focused standards. So, in addition to, you know, uh, 
uh, giving guidelines on designing projects and actions uh, properly this the second category of standards you know they they also focus on giving guidelines on on how to uh, you know like generate impacts uh, and manage your impacts properly so the gold standard basically falls you know within within this category of standard whereby you know we we ensure that projects are designed properly as well as they you know they generate the impacts uh, that were anticipated from the projects and the and then the impacts are also you know managed properly and that's why we have been able to certify uh, till till date around 103 million tons of you know co2 reduction along with other sdgs from around 700 projects that we have certified over last uh, 15 years now some of the key principles you know that we focus within our standards are our projects should not do any harm uh, the projects you know, should uh, involve stakeholders in the designing of the project and across the entire lifetime you know, of the projects and actions, the relevant stakeholders you know, should be involved uh, in the project. Uh, projects should you know, contribute positively and holistically to, to SDGs. Um, projects you know, should then also monitor uh, these SDG outcomes and, and you know, report uh, on these outcomes uh, on a regular basis. And lastly, these projects and actions, you know, should be additional, meaning they, you know, it, it should be demonstrated, you know, that this project would not have been implemented, you know, if, if this safe finance, you know, was not available. And hence, the impacts being generated by these projects are additional to what would have been generated. Now, now all these principles, you know, are basically enshrined, you know, within, within our standards and there are detailed guidelines on how uh, projects and actions should, you know, basically uphold these principles. And then, uh, and then comes the, you know, the third party auditors who are, you know, whose role is to basically, you know, ensure uh, and certify that, that the projects and, and actions, you know, they are auditing have followed you know all these principles you know they have been designed as per the standard they have generated you know a specific sdg outcome so you know we have been talking about sdg 14 in context of this event so 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 you know sdg 14 is is life below water so so there are you know multiple sdg targets and indicators so our standards basically operationalize you know those those sdg targets and indicators for projects and actions to report their performance and outcome, you know, against those indicators. So, so we work with multiple SDGs, you know, across our projects. Uh, our main focus is the 13, which is climate SDG. We work on SDG 3, health, SDG 5, you know, on gender, SDG 7 on clean energy. So, so we work across multiple SDGs and give projects the, the tools to report their, you know, outcomes uh, in line with the SDGs. Now, now you know, uh, like one would one would ask, like, what is the what what is the importance of setting these standards and you know getting this third party certification? So if we look at this specifically from you know impact investor, so so first of all, you know all these you know all this process gives the stakeholders you know into the project the confidence that these projects are designed well and you know they are also performing uh, well as you know as per the plan. Specifically for the impact investors, you know, this, these standards and these third party certifications, you know, what they do is they, they give the confidence to the investor that in addition to generating the financial returns uh, from the project, you know, that I've invested in, my investment is also doing good for the people and for the planet. So the investor is able to ensure that for each dollar invested, you know, they are generating like multiple times of you know returns in terms of of social and environmental benefits so 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 i think you know these these standard certification they have a huge role to play in in attracting you know private sector finance uh, to to you know actions in oceans um, and and you know as, as i think uh, uh, like my previous speaker mr Batista, you know also referred to the bend, bend finance you know uh, area where, whereby investors are looking you know uh, to see impacts from the projects just beyond the financial returns. And the standards basically, you know, play this critical role in giving the confidence to the investors um, that, you know, their, their dollar is being used properly.
Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Abhishek, for kind of highlighting the important role of in, uh, independent verification and certification, um, especially in terms of you know measuring um, uh, not only assessing but measuring also the impact and uh, verifying this independently. So thank you very much. So conscious of time, I'd like to move over to uh, Nicolas. Uh, Nicolas Pascal is joining us from Blue Finance, and will talk to us about the role of private sector and blended finance MBS. Blue carbon and NPA management. So we're actually going to get a, a real, real life example from uh, practitioners. So, uh, Nicola, floor is yours. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mina, and thank you everyone for for listening and participating in this event. Thank you for the invitation. Also, um, I will try to be very brief, and we'll give you uh, after all these uh, uh, very interesting talks a more concrete experience from the field. So, as Blue Finance, what we do is that we uh, co-manage uh, with governments and local communities uh, MPS, marine protected areas. Uh, we are already co-managing four MPS uh, globally in different locations, in Belize, in Dominican Republic, in Philippines, uh, and in Fiji. Um, and what we do is that we structure um, uh, several solutions for these MPS. So, first of all, we try to work only with MPS that have some capacities for revenues so that they become financially sustainable in the future. This is what we call a bankable MPA. Um, that's a concept that we're trying to introduce in the conservation world, not without a, a, a slight uh, difficulties. Uh, but we are focusing on MPS that they can create this kind of social entrepreneurship and creating a blue economy sectors in and around the MPS so that they can become financially sustainable. That's what as Blue Finance we do, and that's what we do with uh, uh, um, uh, directly on the field as a management uh, entity of the MPS. So obviously there's a whole process behind this. There's a preparation phase. It can take some time with governments. We have to work on uh, some kind of a co-management agreement or a public and private partnership or delegation of management that can take some time. So we can define exactly uh, who is doing what. Uh, as you may be aware, any MPA has four, has four main activities of the field that we will implement. Uh, one of them is community engagement and development. Uh, the other one is really uh, 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 nature or wildlife protection, so including surveillance and uh, and, co and uh, compliance. Uh, the third one will be more science and monitoring. And the fourth one that we are introducing is really the management and the generation of revenues. So when we see obviously generation of revenues here, everything is to be reinverted into the MPA. There's no for-profit structure. I think this is important to mention. And obviously based on the sustainable side. So we're working on blue carbon, we're working on nature-based tourism, uh, we're working on sustainable fisheries, aquaculture, macro finance. That's the five main uh, um, uh, income streams that we are uh, developing. So that's, let's say, on the field work. Uh, um, so where we are already quite busy and trying to find some time for, to, to share a little bit of our experience through this kind of, of event. Um, and I would mention a third aspect that we are working also. So beside uh, negotiating with government and beside uh, implementing the management plan of EMPS and developing all these activities, and creating this revenues, uh, we, what we do is uh, we structure a blended finance solution for the MPS. So once we have a long-term agreement from government, once we have a smart business plan, uh, what we need now is to implement it. And to implement it, you always need some upfront capital. You need some money to start with, to pay the staff, to pay the equipment, uh, to invest in an ecotourism facility or to do a blue carbon project. So this upfront capital, but sometimes can go to $1 million, $2 million, uh, depending on the size of a project, is uh, structured through a blended finance solution. Okay, so when we say blended here, uh, that means really uh, mixing catalytic funding, like a grant uh, coming from philanthropy or from government as a subvention, with a more uh, uh, a financial instrument like a debt. Uh, that can come from a concessional uh, partner like a development bank or an impact investor. And obviously, we try to negotiate very blended uh, uh, conditions for this debt. So we are introducing some new concepts around the world of marine conservation. One is the social entrepreneurship. The MPA has to create its own revenues, has to think in terms of creating revenue. So we have to build up all these capacities internally. So what that's we do as Blue Finance with our local partners, uh, uh, that's uh, an implication of at least over the next 10 years in each MPA uh, before we can 
say that the MPA is, 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 has all the capacities to develop these revenues. And the other one is also to create this culture of financial discipline. It's not only money that you receive and you spend, but it's also money that you receive, spend, and you have to pay back uh, to the investors. Okay, so creating this financial discipline, creating the entrepreneurship, and creating a good science behind MPA, uh, this is what we do in Blue Finance. We try to be very reasonable, step by step, and we we'll to go one MPA per MPA. We are managing now four MPAs. Uh, the aim with partners like the Global Fund Coral Reef and other partners is really to upscale uh, this approach uh, on a very reasonable scale and a very patient uh, approach and to learn from how uh, lessons. Okay, so that's uh, um, in a few words what we what we're doing. I see we have someone from Gold Standard. We also have uh, 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 some very clear um, key performance indicators and impact metrics uh, that we are measuring and we might use services like this kind of company independent uh, verifiers for the uh, uh, for the impact and on that I will leave the floor. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Nicola, and I would love to dive more into that. Um, but I think now it's a nice segue as well to look at, you know, the, the, the hospitality sector as such, or the role of um, tourism can play uh, also in nature-based solutions. So we'd like to uh, show a very, very, very short uh, video before we come back to all of you again uh, for some kind of final remarks. Um, and we're running a little bit short of time. So please, um, Diana, if you could, um, show the video that would be great thank you together with my sister i'm the fourth generation of a family business we are in hospitality uh, we operate 100 hotels in 22 countries we're a community of 34,000 employees and we're very passionate about the oceans we come from an island mallorca and 80 percent of our properties are by the ocean so we focus in vacational tourism and the way tourism links as well to the oceans. So for us, um, it is very important to lo look in the long-term vision and the way we do that is we use innovation, quality and sustainability. Sustainability has become a key strategic lever for us. And in sustainability, we like to call it our compromise or our quest towards a more responsible tourism and linking it to our passion for the oceans. One of the things that we feel that uh, is a perfect common ground for IBR Star and IUCN is the usage of nature-based solutions. We didn't want to use nature-based solutions tangentially and maybe use an NGO that is far off our operations. We want to bring it into our clients' experience. We want to bring it to our communities. So using IUCN as a reference of how we can best do that job and use, for example, mangroves to compensate our carbon footprint in countries like Mexico, Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, where we operate, this made common sense and it was a great uh, start point for us. Ten years from now, what I hope is that having a responsible tourism model is the reason why the traveler of the future will choose a company like us and why I feel that in ten years from now there should be a ripple effect and the private sector should follow and should have a point of inflection on what business model for tourism the industry really wants. And I think the guidance of IUCN, the support, the conviction levels that IUCN can offer is what the added value should be brought on the table. Great, so that was we just hearing from uh, Gloria Fluxa from the Iberostar Group, um, who are working very actively about, uh, with sustainability, but also applying for looking at IUCN to apply the nature-based solution. So great practical examples there. Um, I'd like to now quickly turn, before we go back to um, Elena, I'd like to invite uh, Ambassador Kleba to come back. Um, we've had quite a focus today on the Western Indian Ocean. We heard from uh, Wyomsa and the engagement of youth. Uh, we heard as well uh, Nicola talking about uh, entrepreneurship, uh, and you yourself mentioned the Global Fund for the Reef and the need for um, collaboration. So. If you just had to highlight one thing that you think in uh, what is really needed uh, for Kenya to really advance nature-based solution, bring it to scale, what is it that it needs more of? Is it collaboration, entrepreneurship, or um, it's blended finance? I mean, what do you think can really unlock the potential of nature-based solutions in Kenya? And I know you've advanced with your national plan for blue economy. So very 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 quickly and like what what's uh, from what you heard today what grabbed you what what is applicable for for kenya in this respect yeah uh, thank you so much i think first of all 
uh, I must uh, reiterate Kenya's commitment uh, to, 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 to the agenda and uh, also really bring to the fore the fact that these nature-based solutions do work and therefore there's need to kind of work together to get more examples and uh, get involved with the international community to be able to, to, to utilize what is available and the experiences we have had. Therefore, mine is to say that uh, this is very significant and they do provide the narrative which we need to have. Secondly, I think it is important for us to encourage global partnerships and solidarity. And this global partnership and solidarity is towards the achievement of SDG 14. And therefore the support for sustainable financing including the GFCR will go a long way in helping communities and countries to address the challenge we are facing, whether it is in the coral reefs or elsewhere. Then if three, I would like to just place a call for support to the Ocean Conference which is forthcoming in Lisbon. This is very important because not only are we going to share experiences, but we should expect practical outcomes from that conference, which are going to help us in moving forward. And therefore, we believe that conference will governize international solidarity and bring more players and the different uh, organization, uh, NGOs, civil society, and all of us together to be able to, to input and gain momentum towards the achievement of SDG 14. Therefore, as a country, we shall remain in the forefront, both at the local scene in helping our communities to regain uh, the lost um, uh, waters and the uh, environment, but also to advance them, not only in creating jobs, but also to ensure that that environment remains sustainable. The interaction between human and the oceans remains sustainable. Therefore, we shall continue to be in the front. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, as for that comprehensive answer. Uh, and the way, so you really summarize, it's collaboration, global partnerships to advance SDG 14, um, as well as the call to action to really bring more actors, players to um, the UN Ocean Conference in order to advance the agenda and, and move forward. Uh, and thank you as well for your leadership uh, uh, as well, and um, Kenya's. Um, so I'd like to move over to, um, or actually come back to uh, Helena, the, the host for the UN Ocean Conference, and, and really to say you gave a very comprehensive schedule and action plan, but perhaps could you say something specifically about how is Portugal really um, employing the nature-based solutions into your uh, marine and coastal areas or, or this plan that you have so eloquently laid out for us? How do you apply the nature-based solutions concept? Thanks. Thanks, Mina. Just uh, trying to be briefly, just going to mention two examples uh, that we've uh, uh, applied recently. So a good example was uh, around the Portuguese coast, co a project called Biomares. Uh, in the Arab Arabida Marine Park, uh, and this this uh, project was having the aim of restoring and managing biodiversity of this marine park, including restoration of seagrass uh, meadows or prairies. Uh, what we've uh, in this project, what was done was trying to transplant seagrass from donor populations back to this uh, to this place uh, for germination of seagrass seeds, but also posterior plantation. But in, in bearing in mind the genetic diversity, uh, the seagrass restoration itself had some problems uh, due to uh, southern southern storms and intensive herbivorous uh, population. But it actually the project is important. Why? Because it allowed us to have a greater and deepest uh, knowledge about the marine park management, the seagrass distribution population map, their life cycle, and increased awareness of, of how this works. Another example I would like to, to point out, again, with the seagrass uh, meadows, is in the Sado, the, the river Sado and the Algarve uh, regions uh, in Ria uh, Formosa. 
where uh, a project called Ocean Alive is actually doing a, a, a big, big work here. And they have, for example, uh, made a study that conclude for each hectare of seagrass meadow that you plant it, uh, you remove 510 tons of nitrogen from the seawater, just, an, uh, just an, uh, uh, some numbers. And the, this project has reached over 21,000 uh, students and volunteers and civil uh, society public, but most importantly, it has actually had an impact on removing several hundreds of plastic from this and marine litter, but also engaging the female uh, part of the local fishing communities and also providing them with an additional and diversified economic income. So these are just two examples. And the third one I would point out and, you know, bridging to Nicholas is this new fund that we have in Portugal called the Portugal Blue. It's a fund of funds where we actually are doing uh, some blended finance. So it's, it's Portuguese uh, public uh, money uh, from the Ministry of the Sea together with EIF, European Investment Fund uh, money. Uh, we are leveraging 75 a million euros more to the sustainable blue economy project in the next eight years. So the goal of this fund is to actually help projects and some of them uh, around nature based solution and marine ecosystem restoration and services protection. Uh, so these are just some examples of how we are doing this uh, back here in Portugal. Excellent to have those very two concrete examples, and especially highlighted the sea grass, grass meadows. But I think also, as you pointed out, not just even having an impact, but managing to engage civil society, I'm sure that will have a lot of positive uh, spillover effect as well. Thank you very, very much for, for your time and for that comprehensive answers. Um, I'd like to um, go back to Arthur now. I mean, uh, from Wyomsa, you talked about a lot of the, the you know, youth engagement, a lot of the scientific um, research that you're doing and collecting. But I mean, if you can look at it from a kind of nature based solution lens and say, what is the science required or where are the gaps that you need to go in order to implement more nature based solutions and bringing them to scale? Thank you. Thank and if you, you can have, be brief in your answer, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. I think the the gaps in science, uh, uh, I mean, are quite vast and many. Uh, to apply nature-based solutions, first of all, we must all understand uh, interactions between nature and, and, and people and uh, the whole dynamic of, of socio-ecological systems. And uh, one that's one of the areas that still needs to be understood quite broadly. Uh, so we investing quite a bit of uh, resources in that aspect of promoting uh, science that helps us to understand uh, the connections between ecosystems and, 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 and people. So basically in time nature to, 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 to the resource users as well as uh, uh, to other aspects that, that link nature to, to, to humans. So this is one area that is very important. Uh, restoration is a key aspect of nature-based solutions and the science of uh, restoring, restoring ecosystems is quite important. Uh, we have had success stories. We've also had failures in restoration programs. And as we apply nature-based solutions, we need uh, to expand our knowledge on how these systems, how such projects can be made more sustainable and, and, and have successful results. So really, uh, the decade that is ahead of us, uh, we try to outline areas where we can support uh, a lot of restoration work, as well as uh, build the capacity of uh, scientific capacity for the region to be able to support uh, some of the solutions that are being proposed as nature-based solutions. But Kassan's is going to be key uh, to support nature-based solutions. Thank you. Thank you for that take home message. So science is key for nature-based solutions. So we need successful restoration projects in order to be able to implement this. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to turn to Rafaela because you've actually had the experience of, of applying the nature based solution standard to the aquaculture project to be working on um, on the ground. Um, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, some of the learnings and applying the standard and any recommendations you would have uh, from any one of the practitioners or wanting to kind of move forward? With applying the standards. Thank you. Okay, 
thank you, Mina. And uh, for sure, I agree with uh, all the um, the other participants to say that we need the uh, good scientists to to document further, investigate, and explore, you know, nature-based solutions. Um, I'm drawing to your attention, you know, that you know they have uh, they, there are European calls at the moment for research work and uh, pushing towards nature-based solution. Although the the understanding of nature-based solution according to the EU is a bit different, perhaps from the global standard. But anyway, I think there is plenty of space to actually explore more the concept and the tool provided through the global standard. And in the case, for instance, we had with Zanzibar, so we explored Zanzibar seaweed farming as a potential nature-based solution. It's an interesting case because most of this farming is made in the, in the marine conservation area in Zanzibar. It's also practiced by women. So, you know, it's really important in terms of so, so societal issues. And, but even with a, a candidate like that, you know, with very strong assets to say, well, this is a good uh, nature-based solution, uh, aquaculture-based, uh, and included in a general blue uh, economy strategy for Zanzibar. We find out through the global uh, standard, we find out some weaknesses that could be probably much enhanced through some work, additional work by the communities, by the um, institutions, and also the uh, scientific uh, guidance as well. So for instance, you know, you cannot develop seaweed see, see, see farming without taking into account other species, like, you know, you mentioned seagrass, and, you know, there are some potential negative impacts, um, whereas, you know, uh, seaweeds can bring additional benefits to the, uh, the ecosystems. And then uh, the whole uh, uh, economic viability of the system, uh, the global standard brings up um, interesting question about you know what kind of a growth you want what what is is it, is it inclusive and is it very much depending on export markets so you know wh where is the added value where is the, the the general economic system that you want so we have a whole set of questions which belong to the sustainability assessment of agriculture systems but put in in a glance with the the, the global standard uh, tool and that this is where I think it is interesting in terms of concrete works. Thanks. Thank you so much. And I think because we're running out of time, I wanted to give the other two as well um, an um, opportunity to uh, come in. Um, so, um, Jabba, uh, you heard Kenya's call uh, on um, sustainable finance. Um, and I'd just say what's been really the key for the Global Fund for Coral Reef to kind of unlock the private sector uh, investment for NBS. How do you see the nature-based solution fitting within um, your demonstration fund? Please. Thank you, you, thank you Mina, so much for, for that question. I, I think the standard for, for nature-based solution is, is a tool that all of us that are funding sources really, really need to look into and, and take into account when designing our programs. We want our resources to be deployed effectively and, and create change. And I do believe that the NBS standard um, can help us um, achieve that. And um, within that context, and maybe getting to, to, to the other part of your question on what, what's helping us unlock things, I think it's the unlock financing, is, is this tension that exists between the, what, what we need to, to accomplish to get private sector deployed, um, often, the private sector is very much willing to come to the table. They want to deploy resources, but they don't feel the right conditions exist on the ground. And that is what this fund with, for example, the, the, the work that, that Blue Finance also described is, is trying to achieve. We, we want to ensure that through the grant mechanisms, we establish the enabling conditions, we, we pave the way for those investors to feel more secure and able to, to come in. So I, I think that it's a, a key ingredient for, for this success, for this to be successful and the NBS standard can really chart the course and help us get there. Thank you. Yes, let's chart the course together. So for the final two um, uh, panelists, Abhishek and, and Nicholas, I was thinking, 
you know, I'll give you kind of the, the final take home message um, that you like, because um, Amrjit, you have already kind of explained to us why independent certification is important. So from your perspective, uh, what is your ask or what is your plan to, in relation to nature based solutions that you like to give us a final takeaway? Um, and then um, after you, um, I'll invite Nicolas to do the same from a practitioner point of view as well. Thanks. So, you go Thanks, first, Amrjit. Thanks, Meena. Uh, yes, so I would say, I think, you know, uh, from me, from the experience of, you know, uh, carbon markets and the carbon finance, I think, you know, we have seen, the, the world has seen, you know, uh, the, the benefits of using third party standards and certifications um, and, and, the, and the role that these play in mobilizing finance. And, and I think, uh, you know, we should definitely try out the, these, you know, NBA standard with a third party certification. Uh, to you know, see like more finance being mobilized uh, for actions in emotions. Thanks. Thank you. Perfect. And very good. So Nicola, final take home from, from, from you. Yeah, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the Chabez solutions, uh, okay, we, we always have these keywords coming uh, and, 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 and changing every two or three or four years. I think we, we, what we're trying to do is really to reintroduce the role of some ecosystems, changing from gray solutions to more green solution, green gray solutions. Uh, in our case, MPS is obviously clearly a, a nature-based solution. We're using nature uh, to improve some of the ecosystem services, uh, uh, whether it is for ecotourism or for coastal protection or for carbon sink uh, or for fishery, obviously. Um, so saying that, I think we are in the right direction. Um, five years ago, no one was talking about blended finance. Uh, five years ago, there was nothing about coal, uh, a global fund for coral reef, trying to put private sector to invest in coral reef. No one was talking about investing in the marine protected area in Europe. So that, that's a new concept. We have to go carefully of where we're going. Not everything is, is good in private sector. Huh? We have a good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, so, so we really have to find the good ones. So that would be my, uh, it's not a very philosophical one, but that's we really might as well. <laughs> I think that was that was excellent. Um, and maybe not every two, three years, but even longer. Some concepts take a long time, but it's true that they, they, they are rooted in the very similar things and, and they have to change. Um, same thing. We've been talking about investment in coastal ecosystem for, for years or even decades, but it's like, how do you do it? So it's, it's a new way of uh, kind of implementing or advancing or to ensure that investment and, and you know, we are learning um, and as yeah, Jabba has said, you know, it's, it's a kind of a demonstration fund. So um, we're in this together and we can make it work and nature based solution provides an excellent framework for that. And um, so before, uh, obviously, I want to thank all of, of the, the panelists for taking your time to share with us. And um, I know there was a lot more to, to kind of d discuss or dive into. Uh, also for demonstration, we will have um, on the website, there will, you can also find the links to the presentation, both the videos. So once again, thank you very, very much. And I now like to hand back over to Diana to say some final uh, remarks and uh, give a flavor for next NBS vision. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Bina. Thank you very much to all the speakers, to all the attendees, and to our moderator, Nina, today for the excellent work. Um, just a few words to announce uh, that the next session will focus on the on building res resilience a few days before the Disaster Reduction Day. Um, so uh, we hope to see you all uh, at the next session of, uh, of these dialogues. Also to remember, as it has been said, that uh, the summary, the video, and all the links uh, and products mentioned through, through this session uh, are available on the webpage of the event, and that we will be sharing that with uh, who has participated uh, within this session. So thank you all. <laughs>